Hey guys, uh, nice to be with you this morning. Our second little online sermon that we've done back in front of the fireplace at Regina Street. Uh, I heard that that like the number one uh, profession that young people want to have now is to be a YouTube YouTuber. And this is it. This is how you do it, guys. You are a pastor of a church that enters into a quarantine time, and then you're forced to go on YouTube. And uh, that's it. You too could have like 35 views on your videos. Uh, but yeah, another week down. We haven't met. It's hard to believe we haven't met together as a, as a church community since the 8th of March, and we're almost through the, the month. Uh, so let's continue to be praying. Obviously, there's lots of needs. We had a, a, an online prayer meeting on Wednesday and uh did it. it it was different and uh the, there was no escaping the fact that it was going to be different uh but i think it was still good i think it was still a fruitful time and i'm guessing we're we're all having uh different experiences through this time especially depending on your life situation um who your living situation whether or not you're working during this time um some people i think are probably bored some people are probably busy. Uh, it all depends. I, I personally, I made a trip to, to Costco this week and I have to say lots of toilet paper there at Costco, but they are giving out like from the back of the store. It's very weird. You had to go down this like hallway and right at the, uh, the back of the warehouse, they're like rationing it out. Like almost like it's like wartime rations, which is kind of comical. If you think, I think it's kind of funny that toilet paper is the thing that is being rationed out during this time. We're enjoying like juicy steaks and roast vegetables, um, but toilet paper, the thing that we need. So uh, things could be a lot worse. As my dad said, I was talking to my dad on the phone and he's like, even if you run out of toilet paper, there's other things <laughs> that you can do. So I uh, just wanted to start with that, but I did get my big Costco pack of toilet paper. Hopefully you guys have enough. If you need a, a roll, let me know. I'll help you out with the rule. Uh, but for the most part, we're just, I'm just trying to get some stuff done uh, church wise, trying to connect with people and move to this new online reality, at least in the, the short term. So I've been working out here at Regina Street, doing some work from home. Emma's really focusing on the kids' education at home. And what all of that means is that we're keeping pretty busy. This, some days, I, I hesitate to say this, but some days the days, uh, they seem a little too short for us. And so uh, we're fortunate to have been to have been almost too busy. Uh, but I do realize too, at the same time, if you're in a different situation, you might be really bored, like getting, getting or feeling stir crazy. Uh, and so one of the things I'd recommend to you, this is my non-expert, non-medical advice, but just try to get out. Try to get out of your, your place, your apartment, your house, go for a walk. If you're able to go for a run, get some exercise. Uh, I think it's it's really good. If you can get your heart rate up, apparently it burns off the cortisol, the stress hormone that can be in your bloodstream. And there's a lot of benefits to your psychological state if you pay attention to your physical state. If you exercise, there's a lot of mental benefits to that. And I do think that there is a link between our, our bodies, our spirits, our minds. Uh, and so paying attention to all three, our body, mind, and spirit, is only going to benefit you. Uh, if you remember last week, we read this this verse from Philippians right off the top. I'll, I'll read it again because I think it's it's kind of an evergreen verse. Uh, certainly through through this period, it's from Philippians four. It says, "Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God." And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So do not be anxious about anything, but let your prayers, your supplications be known to God. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And we talked about last week, but also through our series, a couple times in our series through 1 Samuel, we've talked about the difference, if there is a difference, between worry and fear. Fear, perhaps, at least the way that I've been talking about it, fear as the recognition of a threat that allows us to respond accordingly, uh, and worry as something, a kind of like agitated fixation on something that maybe we can't change anyways. And so if we're experiencing that, that kind of anxiousness, that kind of anxiety, the encouragement from Paul here 
is to simply to let it be known to God. Let your worry, your anxiousness be known to God. And the promise that comes with that is that the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds. And so we can see that there's a benefit in prayer and in cultivating and developing a habit of prayer, of taking things to God. I think there's also a way that we can guard our minds or pay attention to our minds, pay attention to our thought lives uh, in other kinds of ways and just be proactive in, in terms of our thought lives. And so I came across a, a, a resource from a website called Psychological Tools or Psychology Tools, uh, which is a professional website used by counselors and assessment people. And it talks about, uh, they're giving away this thing about worry in the time of COVID-19. Uh, and so I'll include that as a resource, as a link. Uh, you can download their free guide uh, and see if it's helpful for you. If it's not, that's all right. If it is, that's great. Um, but one of the things I wanted to do is just look at the next couple verses. We are going to get to 1 Samuel, but I wanted to look at the next couple verses in Philippians because uh, I think they are relevant as well. So remember, the peace of God, which surpasses our all understanding, will guard your hearts. And then it says, finally, brothers, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, is there, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. And so here's my suggestion. Um, Again, not as an expert, but just as, uh, as someone who would hopefully offer encouragement. Um, during this time, during our time of, of COVID-19, the reality of COVID-19, try to direct your thoughts in a positive direction. What Paul was saying here, whatever is good, excellent, true, beautiful, think about these things. And what I'm not saying is that we should practice positive thinking in this, I mean, that's great, and I, that, that might be helpful in that, oh, I'm only going to think positive thoughts. But by directing our thoughts in a positive direction, what I mean more is I found it helpful, and I, th I think you might too, to ask the question, what can I do positively during this time? What can I do positively during this time? Notice that's a little bit of a different question than how can I get through this? <laughs> how can I get through this time of social distancing, quarantine, whatever? Um, what can I do positively during this time? I think that's a way of directing our thoughts positively. There's an American politician named Rahm Emanuel. He was high up in the Barack Obama administration. He became mayor of Chicago. And he has this famous little line. He says, never let a crisis go to waste. Never let a crisis go to waste. And so following that line and following the passage in Philippians, I think it might be helpful to reflect on some questions especially maybe for the next while, right? Like, so during this time, how can you benefit your mind? How can you benefit your mind? How can you benefit your body? How can you benefit your spirit? How can you benefit others? And then following Paul and Philippians, think about those things, but then also practice those things. Practice good things. Well, it's certainly we're in a time of crisis that's undeniable. There's people all over the world that are facing incredible hardships, like the worst kind of hardships, pain and death and loss and sacrifice. And yet for many of us, certainly in Canada, our contribution um, is, is still practicing the social distancing thing. But within that, as we're offering our contribution or we're doing our part, I think we can still ask ourselves, uh, are there opportunities for me within social distancing, within the reality of social distancing? Are there positive things that I can be doing? And I, I would say this, that you don't have to set the most audacious goals, like I'm going to write a book by the time <laughs> this thing is over, or I'm going to run a marathon but you can make some progress in a direction that you want to go, a positive direction that you want to head. And if you're making steps, however small those steps might be, I think that's a good thing. That's a positive thing. And those steps can be in terms of your mind, your body, your spirit, maybe even uh, in terms of the social part of your being. Uh, Rob Lowen uh, made a post on our Facebook page uh, 
and and he was mentioning this is the gist of it hopefully i'm getting this right rob but he's he's saying that he's thankful that this pandemic didn't happen 25 years ago and i've been thinking along a similar line i think in some ways our society our culture has been gearing up for this moment uh, for the last like 300 years since industrialization, certainly since World War II, the, the individualism of our society has become more and more intense and more and more easy to, to live life as an individual, not needing um, as many social ties and so on. It used to be just like drive through windows uh, and now it's Amazon one day delivery, it's instant streaming services, it's VPN so you can work from home. And we're really set up in Canada, lots of us anyways, not everyone, but lots of us are set up to live very individualized lives. And I would say like, yes, for sure, let's make use of all that individualism inspired technology. Uh, and that stuff enables us to satisfy our wants and our needs in lots of cases. Uh, I'm enjoying it. But I would also offer this caution. I think it's still important to cultivate and nurture the social part of our being, the social dimension of our lives. And so, so do that. Reach out to people, connect with people, text, chat, FaceTime. Uh, even when I was in line at the Costco, I'm chatting to the guy that's in front of me in line. And obviously we're talking, you know what we're talking about. Uh, but it's still a social interaction that, and there's something I think in our, the way that we're created that needs to have social interactions. So try not to neglect the, the social part of your life, even though we're in a period of, of unparalleled individualism. And so we have our, our church Facebook group as one tool for that. Please continue to use it, check in, give us a little update on where you are, what you're doing, even if you've done one last week or the week before and just say, Hey, yeah, still, uh, still working from home, still doing this, still doing that. It's just good to hear from one another uh, and cultivate that social aspect of our lives. So with that, that's my kind of uh, speaking to the situation part of this. Uh, the rest of the message will go through uh, the, the, the second half of 1 Samuel 23, continuing on in our series through 1 Samuel. Uh, so we'll work through verses 15 to 29 of 1 Samuel 23. Feel free to grab a Bible, open up an app, open up a web page, whatever you need to do. And I'll be using the English Standard Version. Uh, last week, we saw David. He's still on the run from Saul. He's going to continue to be on the run from Saul. And uh, we'll see a pretty cool scene next week. Uh, but for this week, it's, it's just David on the run. David on the run. Uh, last week, what we were talking about was David, though he's on the run from Saul and though he's faced with some situations where it seems like, oh, that's the obvious thing that you should do. Uh, David continued to inquire of the Lord. And so we talked about that a little bit, that that's the best way for us to ensure that we're in alignment with the will of God is to be consistently inquiring of the Lord, inquiring of the direction that God would have us go, developing that as a, a habit, a practice in our lives. And so again, this week we're going to continue to see Saul on the run, or sorry, David on the run from Saul. So verse 15 of 1 Samuel 23 says, David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horish, and Jonathan Saul's son rose and went to David at Horish and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul my father also knows this. So here's Jonathan coming up to David. And I would suggest maybe this is a little example of David's... Uh, social life proving to be a benefit. David has cultivated this relationship with Jonathan. And even though he's on a run, on the run from Saul, his buddy Jonathan still plays an important part in the story. Jonathan finds him and he says this simple line, do not fear, do not fear. And I'd say, I think sometimes it's helpful to have a friend say something like that to us. Sometimes it's helpful to have a friend encourage us, right? 
I love that this is here because although last week we saw David inquiring of the Lord and, and I would presume that there's something about that that strengthens, encourages, edifies David. This week we're seeing David receive his encouragement not simply for, directly from God, but through a friend, through another person. And it's someone he loves and trusts. Further, it's Jonathan that, that reinforces David's eventual kingship, right? He's like, David, you're going to be king over Israel. You shall be king over Israel. And that's amazing to hear from the lips of Jonathan because it should be Jonathan that is going to take over the kingship after Saul. And yet the one who is in line for the throne is the one who is reinforcing David's claim to the throne. We also get a little insight into Saul's mindset here. It says Saul already knows that David is king. Or sorry, Saul already knows that David is king. It says my father also knows this. And I imagine Saul like a kind of uh, presidential candidate. Sorry to bring American politics into this. I know it uh, might leave a, a bad taste or might have a bad taste in people's mouth at, at the time. But you see this time to time in elections where the writing might be on the wall uh, as polling stations are closing and pull and numbers are being released, that one candidate is clearly going to lose. And sometimes, however, those candidates don't concede until the very last moment, don't concede until they're forced to concede. And that's the picture I have of Saul here, or the picture I see in Saul here, somebody that's really hanging on until the bitter end. Walter Brueggemann says this of Saul. He says, Saul knows, but he cannot yet admit it to himself. Saul knows, but he must keep his form or his reputation, even his very identity. Saul knows, but until he finally says it out loud, he does not have to own it. He does not have to relinquish his flimsy grasp on power and on the future. Saul knows, but he does not yet know that he knows. And so his son Jonathan knows on his behalf. And there are, of course, times when we need to give something up, right? We need to make a change. We need to start something new. Uh, we need to know that we need to do, and we, sorry, we know that we need to do this thing. And yet, even though part of us can know, we might not yet be fully ready to admit it, fully re ready to admit that we know. Jonathan sees it for Saul, and I'd suggest sometimes we need other people to see it for us, to be like, hey man, that thing you need to start, or that thing you need to stop. Again, it's it speaks to the, the social requirement that each of us have, I think, to get perspective that is outside our own perspective, whether that perspective is an encouraging one or whether that perspective is a challenging one. We all have a need for it, which isn't to say that we invite that perspective from everyone. It's only to say that that, that perspective is required of people that we trust. Okay, verse 18. It says, the two of them, so this is David and Jonathan, the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Horish, and Jonathan went home. And interestingly, or maybe kind of sadly, this is going to be the last meeting that we see be between um, Jonathan and David. And there's a covenant between them, right? There's this, they form this covenant. They've been making covenants all the time. They're big covenant guys, but... Uh, one of the things we talked about the last time we saw Jonathan and David interacting was that their relationship is characterized by this Hebrew word hesed, hesed. And that's translated into English in different translations, differently in different translations of the Bible. In the English standard version, it's translated as steadfast love. Um, sometimes I think it can be loving kindness or uh, strong love, things like that. But Hesed characterizes the relationship between Jonathan and David. But certainly in the Old Testament, it is also one of the thematic characterizations of God's feeling towards God's people. That God feels Hesed, or God carries Hesed over his people. You can do a word search uh, for the word Hesed and look at all the times that it comes up, or all the times that steadfast love comes up. And most often it's describing or it's characterized or it's, uh, it's part of this kind of unbreaking, covenantal, protective, sacrificial love 
that God has for God's people. But it's also characterizing the kind of sacrificial, steadfast, unbreaking, covenantal love that God's people are meant to hold for God. In other words, hesed is a two-way street. All right. Verse 19 says, Then the Ziphites went to Saul and Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding among us in the strongholds at Horesh, on the hill of Halaya, which is south of Jeshimon? If you guys are reading uh, along, you can pronounce those cities however you want, um, which I just demonstrated. <laughs> so there's another group that's interested in helping Saul find David, right? Saying here, the Ziphites went up to Saul at Gibeah saying, hey, is not David among us? There's this guy that you're looking for. He's here. He's with us, right? And in reading this, sometimes the thought that I have or the picture that I have as I'm reading through this is that, it's only Saul that is against David. Everybody else kind of recognizes David, wants to support David, is on David's team. But there are groups of people that are selling him out, right? They're still loyal to Saul. And the fact is, maybe they should be loyal to Saul. I mean, they don't necessarily know who David is. They don't know that David has been anointed to be the king of Israel. And so actually what they might be demonstrating is simply loyalty to their king. Look at how they call it to Saul. In verse 20, it says, Now come down, O king according to all your heart's desire and come down and and our part shall be to surrender him into the king's hand so like david's in our, our our land come get him come get him we'll give him to you they want to please their king and here's saul's response in verse 21 saul said may you be blessed by the lord for you have had compassion on me go make yet more sure know and see the place where his foot is and who has seen him there for it is told me that he is he is very cunning. See therefore and take note of all the lurking places where he hides and come back to me with sure information. Then I will go with you. And if he is in the land, I will search him out among the thousands of Judah. And they rose and went to Ziph ahead of Saul. So Saul is expressing his, his gratitude, uh, but he's also saying, hey, go look for him. Right? Saul is getting the other people to, to do the work that, that he is going to have to do. Uh, in verse 25, And Saul and his men went to seek him, and David was told. And so he went down to the rock and lived in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. So David is fleeing to the south. He, uh, he goes past Mount Carmel, which is a famous... Um, famous mountain in the Bible, right? If we, you read further on in your Bible, you get to Kings, you'll read about the story of Elijah. Lots happens at Mount Carmel. But what's happening here is, is we see that there's different factions. Some people are supporting Saul going after David. Other people are supporting David. They're tipping David off to the fact that Saul is coming to get him. We're already seeing something of a divided kingdom. Next, we're gonna, next, it's going to say that Saul is on one side of the mountain, David's on the other side. Uh, but more than likely, in terms of the terrain here, when it says mountain, it really means mountain range. And so Saul on one side of the mountain range, David on the other side of the mountain range. And remember, this is like deserted territory, rocks and sand. And they're hiding in caves and around things. It would have been very difficult territory. And despite that, Saul closes in on David. Saul went on one side of the mountain and David and his men on the other side of the mountain. And David was hurrying to get away from Saul. As Saul and his men were closing in on David and his men to capture them, a messenger came to Saul saying, hurry and come for the Philistines have made a raid against the land. So here comes the big intervention. Saul's closing in on David. He's making his way over the mountain range. And it seems like David is about to be captured, right? And then suddenly, seemingly out of nowhere, there's a messenger that runs up to Saul. It's like, Saul, you, we need you, man. Like the Philistines are coming. The Philistines are attacking. And so it says in verse 28, So Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. And therefore, that place was called the Rock of Escape. And David went up from there and lived in the stronghold of Engedi. 
So Saul's pursuit is averted. He's forced to go back and deal with the Philistine threat, who are the more substantial threat to his kingdom, the ones who can actually wipe everyone out. And it's interesting and, and something I think that maybe some of us would wrestle through, which is the fact that it seems like God is using the Philistines here, right? God is using the Philistines to save David. And so the, the question is, well, can that really be the case? Can God use a foreign army? Can God use a foreign nation? And can God use a foreign nation in such a way that that nation is going to attack Israel, is going to attack God's people? In this case, it actually doesn't explicitly say that it's God that's making the Philistines attack, but it certainly seems like God is behind the whole thing. And in other places in the Bible, like if you read through the book of Isaiah, you see that very thing. You'll see God explicitly, uh, the description is explicitly that God is using foreign armies to attack Israel. And that's crazy, right? That's a crazy thought to have. But I think at another level, what we're seeing here is the entanglement of human behavior or human intention and God's intention. That those two things are, are like, even though human behavior is messy, it's somehow linked to God's intention. Even though human behavior can be chaotic at times, it's somehow tied to God's intention. And the thing about entanglements is this, is that you can't always pull them apart. I don't know if you guys fish at all. Something tells me like lots of you don't, but a lot of times when you're fishing, you can get your line tangled up and it can tangle up like on the reel or it can tangle up further down your road, your rod. And sometimes you can't get that knot out. Sometimes you can't uh, untangle it. So you have to cut the line, start again and so on. And I would suggest that the entanglement between human behavior, human intention, and God's intention is like that, that you can't actually untie them, that you can't actually pull them apart. And yet, through that, what happens, even though there's this entanglement that from our perspective, from our understanding, we can't get apart, it seems like, at least on the biblical story, that it's God's intention that prevails. It's not that human intention is is totally washed away or cleaned away. It's in the midst of that entanglement that, he, that God's intention prevails. That seems to be what's happening here, right? David is not going to be captured and killed by Saul. God's intention prevails. And I, I, would, I want to end with this point because I think it's, uh, it's true of our time that as we are in a time of, of the entanglement of human behavior and God's intention, but... We can take heart in this COVID-19 time that even though human intention and, and God's intention are entangled, God's intention will prevail. It did for David, and we can trust, I think, that it will for us. It'll prevail over this situation. It'll prevail for years to come. I'm going to close with this, this little thought. Uh, it's Jesus' words in John's gospel. He says, in this world you have trouble, but take heart for I have overcome the world. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. There's a, a working together of what we do as humans, whether or not that behavior is in line with God's will, and with God's intervention into reality, into human history. And our trust, our hope, isn't placed in the fact that as humans, we're going to get it right. All right, I had to pause the uh, message there because somebody was trying to get in here. Um, it was human intention and God's intention working together. This is God's intention. Hopefully, the, the sermon gets finished, uh, and so we're doing that. But again, I think the thing that we can take heart of, the thing that hopefully would encourage us, is that even though there can be chaos and uh, destruction within human intention or human behavior, God's intention will prevail. The last lines of the Lord's Prayer, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's our prayer through this. Not simply that human behavior will stop and cease, but that human behavior as it's entangled to God's intention will become increasingly in line with God's will. 
But in any event, we can trust, we can place our hope in the reality of God and his kingdom being fully realized. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your blessing over us. We want to pray, Lord, over the world right now as we see a virus uh, that's wreaking havoc in families, in households, in individuals, on, uh, in cities, in societies, in nations. Lord, that we pray your intention would be fully realized over the situation. We want to see your kingdom fully released, fully manifest. We thank you, Lord, that you are good. You th we thank you that you are worthy of our praise, that you are always trustworthy. And we thank you, Lord, for your goodness. I pray you would lead each one of us in the, the way that you want us to respond and you would uh, help us to remain encouraged, remain steadfast, uh, remain filled up in terms of our mind, our bodies, our spirits. Help us, Lord, to connect with one another, love one another, love our neighborhood, our city, our region. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. All right, thanks, guys. Bye-bye.